let's talk about um, NPM Node.js and other stuff. Um, nice to meet you. My name is Baruch, and I'm a developer advocate with JFrog. Uh, developer advocate, um, it's a challenging job, so I really do two things in life. I hang out with the smart guys, developers, operations, uh, and then I come to conferences to speak about it with you. Uh, as I mentioned, not an easy job. Uh, JFrog, um, just two sentences about it. It's a, a startup company based in Israel and California, and um, we have things with frogs, as you might notice, the frogs downstairs and the t-shirts. I have some of them here. Um, ask good questions and you will be rewarded with the cool Super Frog t-shirt as well. Uh, Jevro has two products, Artifactory uh, and Bitray. And uh, today we are going to talk a little bit about Artifactory when we are going to talk, to talk about uh, NPM. So let's start with um, Node.js and Jenkins. First of all, um, how many of you are JavaScript Node.js developers? Okay, and Java developers? Okay. Um, good. So let's start with Node.js and Jenkins. So basically, this is how you do Node.js with Jenkins. You just add a new executor. It could be a shell or Windows command or whatever, and run npm install, npm test. That's all you need to integrate npm or Node.js with Jenkins. Thank you very much. Time to watch. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting part starts, yeah, and then you just need to, uh, to output reports. Yeah, so this is easy, and the interesting part starts when we are start talking about not only Node.js in general, but NPM in particular. So who knows what NPM stands for? T-shirts for whoever knows. Node Package Manager. No T-shirt for you. Is that for NPM? Yeah, it stands for NPM. Yeah, yeah, so T-shirt for you. Here we go. Let's do it later, just come and figure it out. Yeah, okay, so um, um, there is a FAQ in NPM site. Most part of it is, N is explanation that NPM is not, a it's not an acronym and why. It's very long and they're talking about um, that this is NPM, right? A nation associates of pastoral musicians and this is NPM, non-parametric mapping. Those are acronyms. NPM for Node.js is not because, very long explanation, bottom line is it cannot be capital letters because you need to execute it in a shell and in a shell you use non-capital letters and because they have to be non-capital letters, it cannot be acronym. <laughs> no, that's not my idea. Okay, so yeah, this is just part of the explanation. It goes pages and pages why it's not an acronym. Um, well, NPM, although it not stands for Node Package Manager, we conceive it as Node Package Manager. And if it is a package manager, so why we run Node.js with NPM? Doesn't make any sense. It's like if you come from, um, from a, let's say, for, for .NET development, you won't say NuGet run. It's a package manager. It's not an executable. Uh, this is why. Because NPM introduced the notion of package metadata. Package metadata, it's like, again, let's take it to Java, POM XML, which explains what this package is. It definitely has the part about the package management the dependencies, and what this package is, which version, which name, etc., etc. But it also may have scripts part, which dictate how to run this package. And this is like, getting back to Java again, a main class in manifest file, right? 
So this is, this is how we run. Instead of running npm install, we could run this, right? And it would run the same again. So package.json is much more than the dependencies list, but it's also a dependencies list, right here, of course. So um, yet another uh, screenshot from the frequent asked, frequently asked questions in npm side. What is a dependency package? What is package? So package is a folder containing the program described as a package.json file. So it's actually a folder with files, with JavaScript files, because this is now JS. So if packages are sources, what can we speak about here in terms of binary repository, multifactory, etc. etc.? Well, this is why. Package could be also a gzipped tarball containing the folder containing blah 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 blah. And this is how you should work. You should work with the archives because Zips are better, right? It's a single file. You get atomic transfer when you copy the zip around instead of copying many files. Of course, it's faster. It's compressed, right? <coughs> so you should start working with gzips. And when you start working with gzips, you are getting from the world sources when most of you are probably very comfortable and very familiar with, right? Who doesn't know what GitHub is? Okay, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> now you get to the world of binaries, which we have differently, which have different semantics. And this binary stuff, this packages stuff, is something that gets very, very popular. There is a site, modelcount.com, which shows you the trends in packages in any step, in any technology step. So first of all, you can see all of them go up, the one that goes up the most, the light blue line, is NPM. So not only packages are popular, they are getting extreme popularity in Node.js uh, environment. And note the line here, the vertical line here, and there is another one just here. We are going to speak about them later. So yes. For binaries, you need a special treatment. As for sources, you have your source control. For binaries, you have binary manager. And JFrog is a repository manager, a binary repository manager, artifactory, and this is what we're going to talk about in it. So let's build packages for Node. Let's build NPM packages. So it looks like a very simple task. You need to take sources, and you take them from whatever you give them, and then you need to bring the dependencies in in order to test your software before you actually build a package. And here is an interesting question, where you bring the dependencies from? And when we are, we are talking about NPL, where we bring the dependencies from? From registry. From registry. Yeah, you already have a t-shirt, no t-shirt for you. <laughs> <laughs> so here you go, the NPM registry. This is a site which hosts the NPM packages for everyone. And when you install dependencies by default, this is where NPM goes by default. Let's do some analogies with another technologies. This is analogous to what in Java world? Maven. Maven Central, right? This is where Maven goes out of the box to search for dependencies. And for .NET, the Nougat Gallery, and for Ruby, gems. yeah, RPM gems dollar. Exactly. This is this is exactly the same idea, right? The problem is any of those registries or or, or central repositories have issues, all of them, and they are the same. So remember those vertical lines. Now this is funny. How the model count.com works, it pulls the repositories, right? It goes to npm registry, to rubygems.org, to a, a nuget registry, and do a count query on them. Now, what do you think those are? That they are not only outages, 
They are outages in the same time when model count tried to ping them for a number of uh, for the number of artifacts. So you can understand what um, you know what the probability of this coincidence, modelcounts.com queries and NPM registry down in the same time, only in this graph, which, well, this is a huge graph, it covers four years almost, it was coded down twice. And it doesn't mean that it was down twice. It was twice when model count tries to ping them in the same time they are down, right? So, and you can see that they have, the, of course, their status page with all the list of all the outages, and you can see they are like a lot. And people are getting crazy because they definitely cannot build and cannot run their software, and they don't like it. So you can see the Twitter goes still facing and uh, seeing 503s, and we are apologize, and again for, uh, and it's all the time here. More so, you can register to those alerts to get emails, and then it starts to be funny because they're sending you emails every couple of days. So, and then what? Why LPM is given on registry errors? Well, because it's down. <laughs> <laughs> and now people start asking about alternatives. Okay, so now what can I do? I have it once, I have it twice. Now I need to decide what can I do for it. And, you know, you know what can you do for it. You go to the same frequent and question page and you discover that you can run your own instance of NPM registry on your machine. How do you do it? Very simple. All you need to do is replicate their couch database. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> You sure you want to do it? Because you are going to have all the contents of NPM registry on your machine. Well, I can guarantee you, you don't need at least five nines per cent of it. <laughs> and that's because most of it is bad. <laughs> Taking back to the Java world, there is, to the, as of today, there is almost no garbage in Maven Central. And that's because Maven Central is very a regulated repository. You cannot go and upload whatever you like to Maven Central. But you can go and upload whatever you like to NPM Registry. So let's search for hello. <laughs> Can be a registry? Well, I stopped at page six just because I was too bored to browse through. You can now open your own account in NPM registry and upload whatever you like to it. It's full of garbage. Right? So, no. You cannot rely on NPM registry because it's done a significant amount of time and it's full of garbage, and you definitely don't want to replicate it. So, again, where do you bring your dependencies from? And the answer is, you need to have a proper binary repository in-house, which is not a replica of CouchDB of, um, of NPM registration. A binary repository is a source for your dependencies, right? So this is what you had before. All the developers from their machine, they just go and vent directly to the NPM registry. And this is what you have now. You have binary repository between the developer machines and NPM registry. And this is a good thing to do because now you proxy automatically whatever is needed to be fetched from there. And you still have control. You don't care if NPM registry is down, except of the rare cases when you actually need bring the new dependency and you cannot do it because it sounds so it cannot be proxy. In any other case, you really don't care. And you have full control because you have this guy inside, in-house, and you can cover him in any way you like, right? 
And then all you need to do is using this binary repository as a, as a, as a registry instead of a registry, you need to configure your client. So you have two ways to do it. You can edit the NPRC file and add a new, a new URL, or you can uh, issue an npm config command, which will do it automatically for you. So now the question is, why would you do it for each and every machine? Because your home directory dot npmrc file is per user. Why won't you put it inside the package JSON? So everybody that use your package would get the dependencies from your repository and not from uh, NPM registry. Do you have any idea why? It's better to have it configured per user and not per package. Well, okay. Because it's an environmental setting. Why it has to be an environmental setting instead of being a metadata of a package? Because it is environmental. Because it's on where you're running in your development environment. Yes, that's true. And t shirt for you as well. Uh, here's a dragon story from Maven World. Maven allows you to configure the repository that you bring dependencies from inside the package descriptor. In Maven, it's inside POMXML. So yes, the problem is the configuration of the package, or the configuration of how you build the package, and the metadata about the package itself, they are different things, and they shouldn't be mixed together, OK? I'm not sure about what kind of beer, because I have Russian origin, so for me it's very natural. Otherwise, you just drop your money out of the window if you drink them separately. But, OK. So here is an example again from Maven Walls. This is GitHub, and those are sources. And here we have build.grail. This is a build script. Build script uh, talks about how to build the software. And here is the place to declare where the dependencies come from. On the other side, <coughs> metadata, and this is the analog of your uh, package JSON, is part of the binaries. And this is exactly part of your npm zip, or npm gzip, or whatever, part of your module. So in, the, in your module, you shouldn't declare where the dependencies come from. You only say, I need dependencies a, B, C, and the, well, it happens again, duct tape is standing. <laughs> this is scary. <laughs> if duct tape is raining, we are in trouble. inside their environment. In, it could be in XML, in Java, JSON, whatever. And then there is a dependency. Dependency of B1. It comes from the good repository, the one that we just declared, and everything looks good. But then imagine that in the metadata of project B, your package JSON, you could declare where the artifacts came from inside package JSON. If you do that, the transitive dependencies or any additional dependencies of your <laughs> artifact is actually can come from the good dependency that you declare or from the bad dependency that this package declared. And then, yes, and then 
the user is not happy anymore. So that's the idea. Where you take your dependencies from is an environmental setting. It's how your, you build your project. And it's not part of the metadata of the model. That's the reason why it's declared in your user environment variables and not inside the packages. Yeah, so the idea is you should mix configuration and metadata. NPM does it right. You declare the sources for your packages in your environment variables. OK, so now we spoke about bringing the dependencies from the correct place, from your in-house binary repository. And now you build your binaries with NPM. It's very simple. All you need to do is create a module, create package JSON, zip them together, and you're done. Right? This is very simple. And now you want to use, you want to let people use your package. It could be used internally as a dependency for another module, another team, another project. It could be published externally. You want the rest of the world to use your hello world package. Ah, no, that's, that's not, but any other useful package. Or it could be deployed to your server, right, to run a website, an application, whatever. Now here, we're going to talk about the first type of usage, and that's reusing the NPM packages, right? We, we are going to publish them somewhere in order, to, in order to other people will depend on it. And this is the next question. So, and the answer is the same. You need a binary repository as a deployment target. You need to publish your stuff somewhere. So first of all, of course, you can put it on NPM registry as we spoke. But then it becomes public to all the world. And the six pages of Hello World packages prove that it is public for all the world. If I can find Hello World on each and every developer that tries to publish the first uh, NPM package, then your private packages are not private at all. Right? You expose it to all the world. Instead, you want to run the binary repository in-house when you can safely share your private pages. And then you go like, OK, what's the problem? I can put it in my source control. right? I can put it in my private GitHub repositories, my private Bitbucket repositories, or the source control I run in-house. The problem is there is a word source in source control system. Uh, name and it has meaning and this meaning is source control systems are extremely good when working with sources and not that good when working with binaries and why so? that's because they are different sources are text binaries are well not text and because sources being text they are difficult you can compare versions of source with binaries. They are not source, not text, or they are not. The ability to diff between different files allows source control systems to version the file by content, to compare two files and determine the difference. When you cannot do it with binaries, those you version by name. When you version by content, you constantly overwrite the same files. You commit over and over the same source files. When you work with binaries, you should never overwrite a binary. And we're going to talk about a little bit um, afterwards. So this is how it works with source controls. You have some text, and then you add text, you delete text, and then eventually you have the head, the latest revision, which is diff of all the changes from the top part, right? So this is how it works with send, with, with set, and this is how it works with binaries. We are going to version by name because you cannot diff between the content of the binary file. And this takes the source control to its knees and 
the performance degradates very significantly. Now I need someone to stand up and say, hey, you're wrong, because it's not about space, and it's about how it knows how to find pounds, for example. It's not about the space. The space won't go anywhere. When you store binaries side by side, it will take space, no matter if you use source control for them or not. What I'm wrong is, Git doesn't store diffs. And most of you are using Git nowadays, right? Yeah, okay, so all my story about how it won't work with diffs has nothing to do with Git because Git doesn't store diffs. No, can't for you, you didn't get the same. The problem with Git, and it's not a problem, it's a very good feature, but it has its own downsides, is that Git is this dependency. And as you don't want to clone the couch based DB, of NPM registry to your uh, to your machine in order to have a copy of all of it, you don't want to clone all the content of your binary repository of your binary, uh, let's say, directory inside Git to each and every machine. But the problem is you cannot avoid it because Git is distributed system. So if you want to have any of your binaries on your machine, you have to clone them all. And then you say, okay, okay, you are overcomplicating. All I need is a file, draw, a file share, okay? I can have a file share disk, a file share folder, and then I'm good with that. And that's uh, not bad, but I can remind you that this is how you need to do it. And even after you do it, let's see what you have and what you don't have. So first of all, you need to be able to set up this guy easily and cloning the couch DB, it's not. Proxy to other repositories, I rem we are talking about in-house repository and you want to proxy the NPM registry, how can you do it with your file share? The answer is you can. Managing artifact lifecycle, you want to do promotion pipelines with your binaries. You want to take them from development to staging, to QA, to production, and all this should be managed automatically with your file share, you can't. Optimize storage size, the storage is cheap, but if you can gain some deduplication, why not? Security and access control, file share, it's the opposite of security and file, share and, and file access control. And of course, searching by name probably will work, but what about searching by context or by content? We are talking about archive, they can be easily indexed by one. And of course, what you do with your binaries afterwards, you need to take them to deploy them, etc., etc. And this should be done by REST API, which is not available for a simple function. Okay? More so, you probably have more than only JavaScript or Node or NPM development in your organization. So why won't you use the same binary repository for Java, .NET, Ruby, uh, RPMs, uh, your uh, system administration needs, etc. Again, file share probably won't scale. Okay, if you did all that, so I would like to hear about you because you are our competitor and I will be happy to meet. Chances are you did it. Let's talk about file size optimization. So despite the fact that storage is cheap, we are talking about binaries, they are big. So how many of you know that Git stores everything as checksums? Yeah, good, yeah. So now all of you know, any object in Git universe, being it a file, a commit, or whatever, is a checksum file. And actually saved, saved by checksum and it describes some file. And it was there before Git, and we didn't invent it as well, but we use it heavily. So Artifactory is a, a powers a lot of open source binary, a binary repositories, including one of Jenkins, one of Gradle, a Spring, a Grails, and, and what's not. Well, actually, um, it's more, it's most of it Java. 
Uh, and uh, now, if you don't like Java, how many of you don't like Java? Yeah, OK. That, that, that's good. I have seen worse, especially in the Ruby conferences. <laughs> yeah, so that's OK. Yeah, uh, the, main, the main fears, the main, the main uh, what we call fat, right, about Java is being slow. This is not true on modern hotspots. Java is extremely fast. It's complicated. Well, uh, it's kind of is, but there are very advanced topics in Java that the rest of the very hipster-oriented world like Ruby and NPM have a very long way to go until they reach the level of maturity and sophistication there is there is in Java. And one of those uh, one of those aspects that are extremely done extremely well in Java ecosystem is the dependency management. Right? Uh, I hate Maven with passion, but it was really revolutionizing in the way how they managed it, their dependencies. And up until today, it's kind of a standard without, uh, with, with its downsides, of course, but it's a very good standard for all the rest of the software world to follow, including uh, JavaScript, NPM, Ruby, and also. And there is a third very uh, popular uh, theme in uh, Ruby about Java. It's being enterprisey. Well, JFrog as a startup, uh, very young and kicking, uh, can, I can guarantee you that, and we develop in Java, we are not very much enterprise. So, as I mentioned, there is stuff to learn in NPM and Node.js from, uh, from Java. So, and uh, they did a good way. So we can, we can compare JARs to NPMs. They are modules, they are packages, and NPM registry is kind of Maven Central, as we already mentioned. Um, binary repository, well, there is the same binary repository. And um, let's talk about this one as well, serving all the needs in the organization. So yes, if you have any of those and you need to manage binaries in it, you can use the same, the same concept. Now let's talk about CIA. This one. <laughs> well, uh, you know uh, German software. Uh, Joel Polsky wrote very long time ago, I think, what was it? 2001, 30 years ago, blog post about daily builds are your friend and you need a build server that will run your builds continuously 2001, 30 years ago. And so build server just run your builds, show Chuck Norris quotes, done. Right? We started with it. All you need to do is npm install, npm package, and show Chuck Norris quotes. But there is very important thing about the build server, and this is where the action is. Now, think about the build process on your development machine and in the build server. Both of them do the same. They run npm install, npm build, or npm test. So what's, what's the difference? What's actually different between the process you run on your machine with the process you run on the build server? The difference is what you do with the artifacts that you produce. npm install created a package. NPM pack created the package. Now what do you do with this package? On your local machine, you run the build just to verify that it's passing. What do you do with the module? What do you do with the outcome? You throw it away. You don't need it on your machine. What do you do with the outcome of this process in your build server? This is your product. This is what you get money paid for. Think about difference, throwing away, getting the money for. And the process is exactly the same. The only difference is where it runs, on your developer machine or in the build server. And this shows you how differently you need to treat the process on your machine and on the build server. On the build server is where your product is built, is where the action is. And why do you care? Mainly for two reasons. You need it for traceability because sometimes you need to go back in time. 
and try to recreate the exact build process that you had, that you actually uh, had half a year ago, or a year ago, or 90, no, half a year ago, or a year ago. So what do you need in order to recreate the build? Who knows what this is? Who is old enough? Police quest. Police quest, which one? <laughs> one or two? One, one. T-shirt for you. So, uh, what you need is sources, and the sources are in the version control, right? That's easy. Now this, what is this? King's Quest 1. King Quest 1, right. Yeah, dependencies, dependencies are somewhere. Chances are you will find the, de the dependencies in the same place you took them for the first time, and this is NPM registry, but you have a good chance you won't find them there. Because, as I said, it's truly wild west out there. The original author might take it down from there because he didn't like it, because he thinks that he need to retire it and whatever. Chances are you will be able to find it, but you might not. And the metadata about the build itself, what is this? Space this is Space Force 1. And the metadata is in the build server. You might find it there, or you might not, because you deleted the old builds, you reinstalled Jenkins, the Jenkins uh, directory was dead, or, or whatever. So, why would you do that? You can just rebuild from sources, right? Well, wrong. You cannot rebuild from sources. It looks very easy, you need to check out, you need to build, and it's done. It won't work, because take time, this is not very important, but it is unstable. The chances that you will get the exactly the same build half a year later are much lower than you think they are. And that's because your dependencies lie to you. See this guy, this field? If you have those, or your transitive dependencies have those, that means that you won't be able to reproduce your build. Because this actually means version range. This is very evil stuff. Because it means whatever is binary compatible with 4.2.0 is good for me. Half a year later, probably it will be different version than it was before. Right? If it's truly backwards compatible, then you're good. But if it's not, you will have different outcomes. And we actually can, we can do better because we have our build server where the action is. And the build server is the single source of truth. And I didn't know that there is an entry in Wikipedia on a single source of truth. And there is. Yeah. So this is actual term. And this is exactly where everything. If we could capture this information, it would be nice. And since you already have your binary repository in your organization, you actually can do it and save it with the single source of truth. So it's actually like a single target of truth. This is not a real entry, <laughs> although it should be. So it's a place when you save the truth that captures from the source of truth. This is the idea. And when you save the truth with the binaries, you actually have this traceability. Because at any point of time, we can go and go back. How much time do I have left, if any? None? None is good. Oh. So, uh, yes. Now everybody going to use this model. Two minutes and I'm done. Um, what do you do? How do you do this? You write some code, you commit. Then we use and deploys and user run and we install. Looks good, right? This is exactly how it is supposed to work. When you do it first time, everything works. When you do it twice, you will get this error: hash sum check fail. Now you can go to a Stack Overflow and a try to search for hash sum check fail with npm you will get a lot of different responses. But the story is very simple. What happened? You 
just override binary. You didn't check, the, you didn't change the version in package JSON, and you run the same build again. The binary have changed, and this why checksum won't match anymore. Remember I mentioned it? So, what we actually need in NPM is kind of a snapshot a behavior line. And you can get it from semantic versioning, which is what NPM works for. It's called prerelease. Prerelease means after a patch version, you can add any string, and it will mean exactly that. That is actually prerelease. So, our device range gives you the support for that, and with having a snapshot in your entry package, you can have a unique file name in the factory. It works with Java. For NPM, what you need to do is actually change a file, which is a really bad idea because you will have two pushes per any change. One for the file itself and the other for the version file. So instead, what you need to do is doing it with the file. You have the center in the home file, in the NPM file, and you get the unique skill. Okay, now for that, I already won't have time. This is, as you can see, the fun part, but no fun part for you guys. <laughs> Sorry about that. It will, 30 seconds. The developers declare new dependencies and get them from Artifactory. If they are not there, they'll be fetched from NPM register. They commit it to the version control and Jenkins kicks in to take the sources. Takes the sources, run NPM test, NPM install, and NPM pack, producing new module. Right? This module then deployed to Artifactory with all the building for the dimension, and then from there you can distribute it to whatever place you like. It could be Bintory, for example, as being a deployment platform or whatever else you like. Well, for that, I definitely won't have time. If you do interesting in seeing demo, and it really looks like that, <laughs> um, I will be uh, downstairs in the exhibition hall or whatever, and I will be happy to show you this, all this at work. Thank you very much. Peace.